The 2024 World Series matchup is set, with the New York Yankees taking on the Los Angeles Dodgers. Baseball's one seeds are both incredibly talented, employing the likely American League and National League MVPs, as well as a plethora of all-stars. With both franchises spanning over a century, these two teams have plenty of history, especially against each other in the Fall Classic. As we embark upon their 12th October gathering, let's take a look at the previous 11 meetings. This is the Baseball Time Machine. When the two teams met for the first time in 1941, it was a battle for New York with the Dodgers still playing at Ebbets Field in Brooklyn. This was their first trip to the World Series since 1920, back when they were known as the Robins. It was the opposite for the Yankees, who had won 11 pennants already entering the season. Both teams won 100 games that year, with the Dodgers led by former Yankee infielder Leo DeRocher and the Bronx Bombers led by the great Joe McCarthy. Despite postseason experience sitting heavily in New York's favor, the first three games were tied, each decided by one run. Brooklyn sat one strike away from tying the series in Game 4, but it all unfolded, with Tommy Henrik reaching on a drop third strike. The pinstripe stars came up from there, as Joe D singled, Charlie King Kong Keller ripped a two RBI double, and Joe Gordon smacked another double for two runs following a Bill Dickey walk. All in all, the four spot in the ninth made the difference, giving the Yankees a 7-4 win. Game 5 was less nail-biting, with New York leading the entire way, supported by a complete game from Tiny Bonham. The Yankees defeated the Dodgers in five games for their fifth world championship in the last six years. Joe Gordon and Charlie Keller stood out offensively for the Yanks, going a combined 14 for 32 with 10 RBI. Pitching-wise, the lesser-known arm stepped up, helping lead the pitching staff to a 1.80 ERA in 45 innings. Brooklyn had a few future Cooperstown residents, the likes of Joe Medwick and Pee Wee Reese, but were overall largely inexperienced and could never get the bats going. This was just the beginning of the Dodgers' run of contention, though, and the additions of Jackie Robinson, Duke Snyder, and others in the coming years would take them to the next level. Their first meeting on the grandest stage went to the Bronx Bombers, but this would ignite a long-lasting rivalry between the nearby ball clubs. The next time Brooklyn reached the World Series, the Yankees were waiting for them, as would be the case for seven Dodger pennants from 1941 to 1956. As for the first three games of the 1947 edition, runs would come in bunches. A five-run fifth inning fueled New York to a 5-3 victory in the opener. Game two saw the Yanks score in six of eight innings in a steady offensive barrage for a 10-3 win. The Dodgers got a game back thanks to a six-run second inning and never trailed from there. Through eight innings of game four, the Yankees clung onto a two to one lead. Despite eight walks and a wild pitch, Bill Bevins found himself three outs away from a no hitter. After recording the first out in the ninth, Carl Farillo walked. Al Gianfrido pinch ran for Farillo and stole second. With a three and one count, Yanks manager Casey Stengel ordered Bevins to put Pete Reiser on first to set up a potential double play. Pinch hitting for Eddie Stanky, Cookie Lavageno lined a two-run double to right field, walking it off and evening up the series at two games apiece. New York seized back the series' lead in Game 5 thanks to a strong performance from Speck Shea. Not only did he toss a complete game, but he drove in as many runs at the plate as he gave up on the mound, going two for four with a double and an RBI. Now back in the Bronx, neither starting pitcher made it through the third inning of Game 6. The Dodgers held 2-0 and 4-0 leads, but both times the Yankees answered back, going up 5-4 in the fourth inning on an RBI single from Yogi Berra. Dembums rallied in the sixth, putting up four runs to regain the lead by an 8-5 margin. In the bottom half of the inning, Jolton Joe DiMaggio came up to the plate, representing the time run. He got a hold of one, but Al Gianfrido, who had just come on as a defensive replacement, climbed the wall and made a spectacular grab, robbing DiMaggio of what could have been a game-tying three-run shot. Brooklyn would go on to win the game by a score of 8-6, forcing a seventh game back at Ebbets Field. Unfortunately for the Dodgers, they couldn't break through in the winner-take-all affair to win their first world championship. Bill Bevins and Joe Page combined for 7.2 scoreless innings in relief en route to a 5-2 Yankees victory. It was New York's 11th World Series title, already the most all-time.
Two years later, New York and Brooklyn ran it back for a third time, with the Dodgers still trying to win their first world title. Game one was a pitcher's duel between ace Ali Reynolds and National League Rookie of the Year Don Newcomb. The two hurlers combined to fan 20 batters and keep the game scoreless until the ninth inning. Tommy Hendrick was the hero, breaking the scoreless tie with a walk-off homer, the first in World Series history. The Dodgers answered back with a 1-0 win of their own, thanks to a complete game shutout from Preacher Rowe. Game three, like the opening contest, was knotted up entering the ninth inning. The Yankees' offense woke up with RBI singles from Johnny Mize and Jerry Coleman. Brooklyn tried their best to answer back, slugging two solo shots, but it wouldn't be enough as the Bronx Bombers walked away victorious 4-3. The pinstripers went up and stayed up in games four and five, claiming the first of a record five consecutive World Series titles. Joe DiMaggio called it a career after the 1951 campaign, but that didn't stop the Bronx Bombers from returning to the World Series the following year. Naturally, they met the Dodgers once again. Brooklyn took the first game of the set thanks to a complete game from Rookie of the Year, Joe Black. Three of the first six National League Rookies of the Year were Dodgers. The pennant winners alternated victories through the first six games, leading to a winner-take-all Game 7. The final contest was similarly back and forth. They exchanged runs in the fourth and fifth, but Brooklyn couldn't counter Mickey Mantle's round-tripper in the sixth. Mick added one more in the seventh with an RBI single, making it a two-run game. Dem Bums loaded the bases in the bottom of the seventh with Duke Snyder and Jackie Robinson due up. Freshly into the game, Bob Kuzava got the two immortals to draw infield pop-outs, escaping the jam. Kuzava secured the final six outs in the eighth and ninth, leading the Yanks to their fourth straight world title. This time, Brooklyn Star showed up, but in the biggest moments, they faltered, allowing the Bronx dynasty to continue. Not satisfied with last year's result, the two powerhouses came together again in 1953. The Yankees took the first two games at home. Game two had some fireworks, with Billy Martin slugging a game-tying homer in the seventh, and Mickey Mantle blasting a go-ahead two-run shot the following inning to grab a lead they'd hold on to. Back at Ebbets Field, the Dodgers grabbed the first two contests there. They took game three thanks to a go-ahead home run from catcher Roy Campanella. Game four was a comfortable victory after tagging Whitey Ford for three runs in the first inning. Game five was a slugfest and a turning point in the series. Six home runs were hit that day, starting with the first batter of the game. Gene Woodling got the Yanks started with a solo bomb. It was salami time for Mickey Mantle in the fourth, two batters after a Gil Hodges error that would have gotten Brooklyn out of the inning. Offense continued throughout the fixture, including the Dodgers scoring five in the final two frames. But it wouldn't be enough, as the Yankees obtained a 3-2 series lead with the 11-7 dub. With New York one win away from yet another series triumph over the Dodgers, both teams played a tight-knit Game 6. The Yanks took an early 3-0 lead, but Brooklyn slowly closed the gap. Allie Reynolds, on for the save and two outs from the title, made a huge mistake, allowing a game-tying two-run jack to Carl Ferrillo. Reynolds caved the next two batters, keeping the game tied heading into the bottom half of the inning. Unfortunately for Brooklyn, their comeback attempt would be for nothing, as Billy Martin laced a walk-off RBI single to secure the title for the Yankees. It was a huge series for Martin, who in the present day is rarely mentioned for his time as a player but rather his controversial managerial career. New York had won their fifth world championship in a row and moved to 5-0 in fall classics against their crosstown rivals. The Brooklyn Dodgers had still yet to win a World Series. They fell to the Yankees in 47, 49, 52, and 53, twice reaching Game 7 just to fail. In 1950, they were eliminated from the pennant race on the final day of the season by the Phillies, who went on and got swept by New York anyway. The next season, Brooklyn was two outs from claiming the pennant, but blew a 4-1 lead to the Giants, culminating with Bobby Thompson's shot heard round the world. When they lost the pennant in 1954, many thought the boys in blue might be done for. They'd come so close, yet felt so far from champion status. Guys like Jackie Robinson and Pee Wee Reese were aging, but they still had some prime ballplayers, most notably Duke Snyder and National League MVP Roy Campanella. Despite doubt creeping into Dodgers fans' minds, 
they secured the pennant with ease in 1955, setting up for another date with the Bronx Bombers. The most famous play of the series and one of the most memorable in all of postseason lore came in game one. That's where Jackie stole home. It came with two outs in the eighth, cutting the deficit down to one. Although that play is usually all one can remember from the contest, the Yanks finished the job in the top of the ninth, winning 6-5. Tommy Byrne tossed a complete game in the second Bronx showdown, powering New York to a 4-2 victory and 2-0 series advantage. Home teams continued to reign supreme as the Dodgers took all three games at Ebbets Field, storming back and positioning themselves one win from glory. The chairman of the board didn't hear no bell, tossing a complete game in a comfortable 5-1 success to force a deciding seventh game. Johnny Padres, who pitched the full nine innings in Brooklyn's Game 3 win, got the start in Game 7. He hurled the game of his life with the title on the line, a complete game shutout in the Dodgers' 2-0 conquest of the Yankees. In the first year that it was given, Pons was awarded World Series MVP for his masterful pitching when it mattered most. It took eight tries, five against their crosstown foes, but a World Series title finally came home to Brooklyn. Their final meeting as New York neighbors, the 1956 Ball Classic flipped the script on last year's seven-game thriller. The Dodgers took the first two games at home with Sal Magley outdueling Whitey Ford in Game 1 and Brooklyn scoring a series-high 13 runs in Game 2. Back in the Bronx, the Yanks took charge, winning three straight to take a 3-2 series lead. Game 4 was a clean 6-2 win with the Yankees never trailing, supported by homers from Mickey Mantle and Hank Bauer. After getting knocked out in the second inning of Game 2, Casey Stengel gave Don Larson the ball for Game 5. A shot at redemption was all he needed, as he tossed a perfect game, the first no-hitter in World Series history. It remains not only the lone perfecto in the World Series, but all of postseason play. Game 6 at Ebbets Field was a real battle between two underrated arms. Bob Turley and Clem Levine matched zeros into the 10th inning, where neither team had touched third base to that point. Levine posted a 1-2-3 10th, putting the pressure on Turley as the Dodgers had a chance to walk it off and force Game 7. Bullet Bob was the one to falter, allowing Jackie Robinson to drive in the winning run with a walk-off single. It was the last highlight of number 42's trailblazing career. Robinson's game winner would represent the peak of Brooklyn's season as well. The Yankees steamrolled them in Game 7, winning by a score of 9-0 behind a three-hit shutout from 23-year-old Johnny Cooks and a quartet of homers, two by Yogi Berra. The Bronx Bombers had won yet again, their sixth title in eight years. Don Larson took home World Series MVP for doing something that had never been done before or since. The immortal Jackie Robinson recorded the final out in the series and retired following the season. Ultimately, the Dodgers lost six of seven fall classics against the Yankees while playing in Brooklyn. Thanks to westward expansion, everything would change within just a few years. The Dodgers franchise moved out west to Los Angeles in 1957 and celebrated by winning the World Series in 1959. What took 52 years to achieve in Brooklyn took two in LA. The 59 installment of the Fall Classic was the only one from 1955 to 1964 in which the Yankees didn't represent the American League. The next time LA returned to the grandest stage, New York was waiting. This meeting was unlike any other that the two powerhouses had together, as it's the only one to end in a sweep. Shockingly, the Yankees went down in four games to the Dodgers. It was only the second time in their first 28 World Series appearances that the Yanks were swept. LA's pitching, specifically the triple threat of Sandy Koufax, Don Drysdale, and Johnny Padres, absolutely dominated, only allowing four runs in four games. They only required two outs from the bullpen all series. We'll never see a collective performance on the mound like that ever again. The Dodgers managed to neutralize the pinstripe stars. Mickey Mantle only recorded two hits. Roger Maris suffered an injury in Game 2 and was lost for the series. He and 38-year-old Yogi Berra only combined for six at-bats, all resulting in outs. American League MVP Elston Howard hit 333, but all five of his hits were singles. The Yankees hadn't been dominated in the World Series like this in decades. Koufax caved 15 in their 5-2 Game 1 win. 
New York went one for seven with runners in scoring position as Johnny Padres fired 8.1 strong in game two. Don Drysdale tossed a three-hit shutout in game three, and Sandy Koufax finished them off with a complete game, eight strikeout performance. Los Angeles' offense didn't necessarily stand out, but did enough to win each game. The story was definitely pitching. For that, Sandy Koufax won World Series MVP, an award he would take home in his next trip to the big dance as well. Each team returned to the Fall Classic within the next couple of years, but wouldn't meet again for over a decade. By the time they stood face to face once more, the landscape of baseball would be much different. The Koufax Drysdale Dodgers won two more pennants, winning it all in 1965 and falling to the Orioles in 1966. LA returned to the Fall Classic with a fresh young team in 1974, running into the dynastic Oakland A's, who completed their three-peat that year. The Yankees lost again in 1964, then endured their longest title drought since the acquisition of the great Bambino. Eleven years passed without the Yanks in a World Series until 1976, when they returned to the grandest stage under second-year manager Billy Martin, just to get swept by the big red machine Cincinnati Reds. Either way, both New York and LA were in new windows of success, so it was fate that the two would encounter each other again in October. The Yankees made a big splash in the 76 offseason, signing outfielder Reggie Jackson. Joining the likes of Thurman Munson and Lou Pinella, the Bronx Bombers were able to take their offense to another level. Under rookie manager Tommy Lasorda, the Dodgers won 98 games and the NL West, defeating the Phillies in the NLCS to advance to the World Series. The series opener was a 12-inning classic, ending with a Paul Blair walk-off single. The move to replace Reggie Jackson defensively in the ninth paid off, as Blair played hero and gave the Yanks a 1-0 series lead. Los Angeles answered back with a 6-1 victory, as Burt Hooten easily outdueled a floundering catfish hunter. New York grabbed the first two games at Dodger Stadium as a result of commanding outings from Mike Torres and rookie Southpaw Ron Guidry. With the Bronx Bombers one win from Paydirt, the boys in blue answered back with a 10-run outburst in Game 5, keeping their title hopes alive. Reggie Jackson took Don Sutton deep in his last A-B, foreshadowing the Dodgers' doom. Game six is remembered best for three swings and three homers, all off the bat of the man they now call Mr. October. Following a four-pitch walk, Reggie Jackson managed to leave his mark on game six and postseason history with two run blasts in the fourth, fifth, and a solo shot for good measure in the eighth. The Yankees won the game and the series due to Reggie posting one of the greatest playoff performances you'll ever see. He joined Babe Ruth as the only men to hit three home runs in a single World Series game at the time. To no surprise, he was named World Series MVP. New York's title drought was over. The Bronx Bombers were back on top. The Yankees and Dodgers wasted no time running it back the following year. This time around, it would be LA who had home field advantage. The Dodgers could feel it and jumped out to a 2-0 series lead. They took the first game with ease, powered by Davey Lopes, two homers and 11 runs in all. Game two was much tighter, a 4-3 finish. Bob Welch came on for the save and won a nine-pitch battle with Mr. October to secure the game. Now in New York, it was Greg Nettles' glove that won the Yankees game three. The two-time gold glover made several key plays to prevent runs and keep the Yanks in the lead. American League Cy Young winner Ron Guidry didn't have his best stuff, but did enough to keep LA at bay and take the 5-1 win. The Bombers battled back from 3-0 down in Game 4 to force extras. Lou Pinella was the hero with a walk-off single in the 10th to knock the series up at two games apiece. They pulled away from there, outscoring the Dodgers 19-4 in the final two games, winning both to claim their 22nd world title. Meeting for the final time in the 20th century, it came under bittersweet circumstances given that year's baseball strike. Neither team had the best overall record, but made the postseason based on their strong first-half performances. Both the Yankees and Dodgers fought through the first installments of the division series on the road to claim another pennant and reunite in the World Series. New York took games one and two behind strong pitching performances, especially Game 2, in which ex-Dodger Tommy John and Goose Gossage combined to shut out their Californian counterparts. 
momentum shifted with a change of venue as the Dodgers pulled out a trio of one-run victories in LA to take a 3-2 advantage in the series. Rookie sensation Fernando Valenzuela tossed a complete game in Game 3, ending the first season of Fernando Mania on a high note. Game 4 was messy, with Dodgers starter Bob Welch pulled after only four batters, but the offense rallied late to seize an 8-6 edge. Reggie Jackson's late solo shot wouldn't be enough, as Los Angeles walked away with an 8-7 triumph. Game 5 was a vintage pitcher's duel between Louisiana Lightning and Jerry Royce. The Yanks clung to a 1-0 lead into the seventh inning, where the Dodgers took charge with back-to-back -back jacks from Pedro Guerrero and Steve Yeager. Those two swings would be all they needed, as LA pulled out the 2-1 win. Returning to the Northeast for Game 6, a controversial move was made from up top that would change the trajectory of the potential elimination game. In the fourth inning, team owner George Steinbrenner called down to manager Bob Lemon in the dugout and demanded that Tommy John be pinch hit for, despite his solid work to that point in the contest. Not one to mess with the boss's orders, Lemon complied, taking John out in the bottom of the fourth. The bullpen almost immediately blew it, allowing three runs in the fifth and eight in total en route to a 9-2 Game 6 defeat. The Los Angeles Dodgers had conquered the New York Yankees for the third time in their storied postseason saga. It was a team effort, and there was no better display of that than with the World Series MVP, as it was split three ways between Ron Say, Pedro Guerrero, and Steve Yeager. So this is how things end between the Yankees and Dodgers, until 43 years later, the Bronx Bombers and LA Dodgers are back to represent the best baseball has to offer in the Fall Classic. Featuring sluggers Aaron Judge and Shohei Otani, it'll be the first World Series to host two 50 home run hitters. Both men led their respective leagues in round trippers, making it only the sixth final to pit each league's home run leaders against each other, and the first since 1956, which included Yankee Mickey Mantle and Dodger Duke Snyder. No matter the result, the 2024 installment of the World Series will be one for the ages. From the history between the sport's two most iconic franchises to the abundance of star power, millions will be glued to the television set to see what happens next. This has been the Baseball Time Machine. Thanks for traveling with us.